I was very, very fortunate with my journey. It was small, it was caught early, it was non-invasive, and I had the best of all possible outcomes all throughout the process. And that was one thing that I was really enlightened with is it's not one size fits all. It is totally to the individual from the treatment to the course, you know, of, you know, what's being done. Just focus in on your own self-care, whether it's, you know, prayer time or prayer time, meditation, yoga, whatever, whatever it is, your, your walk by yourself in the neighborhood, whatever it is that you have to do, don't look at it as that you're being selfish. You are taking care of yourself. And this is, it's so important when, when you're going through treatment. It's so important. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 196. My name is Andrew. This is Michelle, and apparently we are podcasting. We are starting. Wow. Sorry, I didn't realize I was supposed to give you a, a count in. Well, I mean, how about a a, a start, a go? You ready? So we're here at Den Splice Serona World, 2019. Yeah. In beautiful Las Vegas. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. In, in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. <laughs> Not not trashy, Las Vegas. Not trashy at all. I did see Christina Aguilera last night, and my life is so a little trashy. I'll slap you right now. Oh my gosh! Somebody um at the end of the row was like, "She's definitely lip syncing," and I was like, "I will fight you and throw you over this balcony right now." <gasps> Don't you ever talk about Christina in that way? I didn't realize you had such a, a love for her. She can sing. This is all yeah. brand new to me. Hmm. Anyway, you know. So yeah, so we uh, did the dance place around a thing. Mm-hmm. That and thing, that big was, conference. It was actually really, really, really good. Yeah. We, we talked about it before. Where I'm like, you know, I like how having like hygiene tracks. Mm-hmm. I like the organization of it all, but I've never firsthand experienced it like we have this time. I, I would love to see more hygienists here. I think that's the yeah that's the goal, the right? Action, yeah. I, I think more hygienists need to be here. There's a ton of dentists that are here like using their technology and, but there needs to be way more hygienists. Here. So I feel like the, a lot it's of the hygienists are engaged in the practice and like the production promotion, the utilizing the technology mm-hmm. and you have like hands-on experiences here, firsthand lectures from the manufacturers and their, you know, key opinion leaders and things like that. So yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, you should definitely check it out. It's not always in Vegas. Last year it was in Orlando. Well, so yeah, it moves around. Again. It is. They announced it. Yeah. You should definitely at least try it. If you haven't gone to a conference, put it on your list. You know, I believe you should always be jumping around conferences. Right. You should definitely sure. check out ADHA, check out RDH, check out AAP, check out Densply, what other, whatever else I've probably, Hinman, Greater New York, Chicago, Midwest, like switch it up because everyone's got something a little different to offer. And if you don't, you kind of pigeonhole yourself and you might be missing out on some good education. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, today's my mom's birthday. HBD mom. She'll never hear it. Good but, job, Brenda. Yeah. Way to have a birthday today. Way. Well, usually her birthdays have had natural disasters on them. Uh, so luckily today is sunny and beautiful in Charleston from what I hear. Um, but we recorded a round table for this interview on breast cancer survivors. And Mary Jensen and Chris Potts were kind enough to come on the podcast and tell us about their experience. And we wanted to highlight, because this is the start of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we know that our fellow colleagues are have gone through some real personal challenges and we really do appreciate them sharing their stories and their success. And honestly, some maybe, uh, no, no's and don't say's to, uh, people who are going through, I think any kind of cancer treatment Mm. or, well, we learned a lot, even with suicide prevention, like any kind of loss, any kind of mental health issues. But you know, when you have those cancer scares and you're struggling and surviving chemo and radiation, like that's a real tough, moment but some people said 
like when she said it on this, you'll hear her. She said, um, well, at least you got the good cancer. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> where does your head have to be? But hopefully that was a learning opportunity for this person. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. But we um, really do celebrate you guys and your um, remission. And for anyone else that is struggling with a, a cancer diagnosis, um, Chris and Mary have both asked if you're welcome to reach out to them and um, really share your stories and be a support group for each other. So we do hope you enjoy this round table with Mary and Chris. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. Well, listeners, um, this is going to be a slight different start to the month. Um, We are starting October. That is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we wanted to highlight this Uh, Because we have two hygienists on right now that have gone along this journey. And I thought it would be, well, this is actually the suggestion of Mary, but when she mentioned it, I thought, wow, what a really good conversation to have because there's probably some fellow hygienists out there that have either gone through the process or along this currently in the journey. But also we know patients, we know colleagues, we know our cohorts at school. So everyone has been touched in some way by breast cancer. And I think this is going to be a really meaningful conversation to have. So I want to welcome Mary Jensen and Chris Potts to the podcast. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah, great. So um, I do want to take a little moment. I mean, you both have been on the podcast, but let's just talk about who you are before we kind of jump into uh, this topic today. How's that work? Good? Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Mary, I'll let you go ahead since you kind of brought this to me. Okay. Um, I'm Mary Jensen. Obviously, I'm a registered dental hygienist. I've been a hygienist for 38 years. Um, all of that was clinical up until about the last four years where I've been involved with the High Life Oral Health Alliance. So I see clients every week in memory care communities to provide oral hygiene care. And I absolutely, I love it. I love working with seniors. I love working with individuals with dementia. And, um, I think it's just a, it's a, it's a great thing to do as a hygienist. That's awesome. It really is. And Chris, I'm Chris Potts and I have been in dentistry for over 40 years and I no longer practice clinically, but I am a speaker and a writer and my topic happens to be oral care for the oncology patient. Uh, I have had experiences in my life with myself and with loved ones that uh, I feel like I have some information that I can bring to that venue and share with my colleagues. Um, I also am a educator for Water Pick, and I'm enjoying the heck out of uh, working from home <laughs> mostly and uh, being able to share the information. That's great. So, you both have um, some, you know, invested interest in this topic. So do you want to start with your journey and how you felt and the experiences that you've gone through? Chris, do you want to go first or do you want me to go? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I, I can. Um, I was uh, diagnosed in 2015 and the it wasn't a surprise because I've always had irregular Uh, mammograms and things like that, but it's still a shock to hear that diagnosis. And when they start talking the word biopsy and things, it does tend to strike fear in you. And I was very, very fortunate with my journey. It was small. It was caught early. It was non-invasive. And I had the best of all possible outcomes all throughout the process. So I consider myself uh, one of the very lucky ones, very blessed to have had that as my journey. But I have also, as I said, been a caregiver and understand, uh, been there for people that their journey has not been so fortunate. And that I think that's why I feel so blessed because mine was. I know what it could have been. Right, right. Mary? 
So um, I was diagnosed October of 2018, so I'm not even at a year yet. Um, it was on a routine mammogram. Um, I go every year, first week of October for my mammogram, you know, just like, you know, you're supposed to do every year. And no family history. Nothing was there last the year before. It was very close to the chest wall. It could not be felt. Even the breast surgeon could not feel it. Um, it was already at 10 millimeters. And I know as hygienists, we understand the whole millimeter thing, right? Um, but it was already invasive, meaning it had um, broken its way out of the milk duct and it was in the breast tissue. So um, you get that phone call and you hear those words, invasive ductal carcinoma, and you wake up. You wake up because you think um, they must be talking to the wrong person. <laughs> uh, this can't be me. <laughs> what, what, what are they talking about? So, um, yeah, then, then your road from there goes to, you know, MRIs and additional biopsies. And I had surgery in, a, in December, uh, lumpectomy, lumpectomy and a, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, fortunately, since it was so early and it was so small, they got clear margins and there was no lymph node involvement. So that basically bought me a get out of chemo free card. Um, so I had my surgery and then I went, um, I healed from that. And then I did um, four weeks of five days a week radiation therapy. And now I'm on uh, oral chemo for the next 10 years. Wow. So I'm curious how you guys feel after this experience about the frequency of mammograms. And is this a question that we should be asking our friends and our patients? I believe it is. Uh, I think it's very, very important. Uh, I did go routinely. As I said, I had a, a history of uh, questionable uh, scans and things like that. I had had uh, cysts and uh, things like that. I even had a benign tumor removed back when I was in, a teenager. And whether you have a family history or not, it, like Mary said, you know, it can happen to you. And not everything is going to be felt. It's not going to be detected with uh, a self-exam. A lot of times you have to advocate for yourself when you know something's wrong, that uh, you might get dismissed by a PCP or uh, even the radiologist. But uh, I think it's important that everyone do it and uh, screen early. As far as frequency, that's going to depend on your risk factors. Good point. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. I just, you know, I, you have to put your trust in your doctors. And my doctor's recommendation was, you know, the annual mammogram and everything I read on, on that kind of pointed in the same direction. And I was, I was comfortable with doing that. And interesting, like the radiologist, one of the things that he did say to me, you know, when I got the phone call was that you've done everything in your lifestyle to prevent this. You know, I've always maintained a healthy weight. I've always, I've never smoked. I've, I exercise. I'm a vegetarian for over 20 years. I mean, like you name it, you know, it's my lifestyle. And he goes, but the best thing that you've done is to go for your yearly mammograms. He goes, that's, that's basically what saved you. Because if you had let this go out five years, it would be a totally different story. But again, like Chris said, everybody's got to go with what their own comfort zone is and what, what their medical provider is recommending. Is it 35 that they're recommending or is it 40 that you start going? I thought it was 40. Do you know? I, Chris, do you know for 40? I, thought I so. was okay. thinking they had bumped it back to 35. But I I can't be certain. I'm way past that anyway, so it didn't <laughs> affect me. <laughs> so when you got the diagnosis, I, who did you turn to? Did you have friends and families or colleagues that had also gone through something similar that you could turn to? The first person I called, because I was I was parked when I got the call from the radiologist. The first person I called was my husband. And I just said, buckle in. <laughs> Those were my words to him. We're just buckle in because I have no idea where this is going to go. And I did have one uh, girlfriend, actually another hygienist, who had gone through something similar. And she gave me some really great advice. We went out to lunch and she gave me some really great advice was to hold things close. You know, hold things close and protect yourself, like, you know, self-care. And that was 
you know, we give, give, give to everybody else. And now suddenly that table got turned and now it's like, oh no, I, I got to take care of myself. That was like, that was a really good thing to hear right at the beginning. That's good advice. And that's very similar to what uh, I felt, you know, the hold it close. My my first call was to my best friend because my husband was at work and I wasn't going to dump that on him at work. But um, I told the uh, my husband and my daughter, my best friend, and a few others that uh, have been close friends to me that have always been prayer warriors for me as well. And I wanted that to begin. And then uh, I do I do have a family history. So uh, unfortunately, most of them have passed on, but I did call my cousin and got some information and some advice from, from her on that. But I didn't tell many people at all because I didn't know where exactly this journey was going. So until I had the pathology report back, until I knew what kind of treatment they were going to recommend, I wasn't going to go there yet. And I just didn't feel comfortable uh, telling people about it. So when you had these conversations or you told people later on or going through the process, were there some comments that maybe uh, should not have been said or people just being ignorant or not very thoughtful when they were speaking to you? Oh, there were a lot of them. And and (laughs) I would probably start with saying, I'm sorry if I ever did that Mm -hmm. to anybody else, not even knowing that I had done it to somebody else, because I certainly would be my intent. But um, there were so many, like, just off the cuff, offhand comments that I was just taken aback by like one person said, well, now, you know, you better start eating meat that could have prevented the cancer or, you know, cause I was a vegetarian. Yeah. Or you need to eat more asparagus. That'll cure you. Or um, the one that really stopped me in my tracks was, did you get the good cancer? What? And I didn't know what that meant. And what they meant was, do I have to do everything, chemo, radiation, you know, or did I get the good one? That just means just surgery. It was just really, really strange. And I had one person tell me that I didn't really have cancer because I didn't go through chemo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you just have to take a step back and let them say what they're going to say. And then whoever, whoever your person is that you go talk to, to vent that you vented and you know that they don't, They're not trying to hurt you, but um, I got, again, very guarded that if somebody started a story about somebody, somebody's friend's cousin, I'd stop them and i go, if this doesn't have a happy ending, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Such a good point. I don't want to hear it. If you have a happy ending story for me, I'd be happy to listen. But especially when you're early on, you don't want to hear everything that was negative with somebody else. I don't know. I I agree totally (laughs) because they're, you you know, it's just, uh, I'm used to tell my patients all the time that it's kind of like giving birth. Um, You know, you hear the, the horror stories of labor uh, and things like that. Oh, it was several days, several hours. And it just, you know, was awful and it can scare you to death with that. But you stop and think about, the, the thousands, the thousands and thousands of women who have given birth multiple times and it was relatively uneventful. They didn't have a story to tell. So it was usually the horror stories that got shared. And you don't need that. You don't want that. You have enough anxiety, enough fear going on that that's not helpful at all. <laughs> Yeah, it's not. You're right. (laughs) And so when we're speaking to our patients, being mindful of comments like that, I mean, do you have any suggested or go-to comments just, you know, wishing you the best? Is that kind of a better one or just being very medical about let's, you know, writing things down and then we kind of move on from it? I think that as hygienists uh, and in the dental profession, we can offer ourselves as a resource uh, to our patients. 
a lot of times there are things that can go on that their their oncologists don't talk about that they don't know about uh, that we as experts in the oral cavity do understand. And I think other than offering your your sympathies and wishing them the best, and if you know that patient, you know, offering to pray for them and then offer yourself as a resource. If they aren't interested, if they don't want the information, then, you know, be quiet and move on. But a lot of times they, they will and offer yourself as a uh, someone to turn to for that if you want to talk, if there's anything I can do for you and just offer yourself out in that manner. And they, they'll come to you. Right. I, I agree with everything that, that Chris said. I think just sometimes um, listening more than talking is, is good and just kind of give a, a little pause and let them maybe, you know, expand a little bit more on, you know, what they've gone through. One thing is for sure is that every, everyone who's gone through breast cancer, I know the journey, right? Everybody's is different. That it's not, and that was one thing that I was really enlightened with is it's not one size fits all. It is totally to the individual from the treatment to the course, you know, of, you know, what's being done. So I think just giving them time to kind of, you know, maybe express a little bit more about what they've gone through and then just offering any kind of resources that you can to help them would be would be great. Yeah. I, anybody would appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sure. And I would also imagine that it's a roller coaster of emotions once you are in in it. And so can we talk about some of those? Because I'm sure there are some that our patients will be going through and just being empathetic towards that situation. It, it would be nice to know what that roller coaster was like. I know for me, it was, it was the waiting. It was always the waiting. And I feel very blessed that I live, I'm in the suburbs of Chicago. So we have amazing, you know, care you know, medical care. I, it's just, you know, a, a walk away practically. We're also in an area that's very populated. So, you know, you don't get in in 24 hours. You, you might have to wait two weeks for that, you know, MRI guided biopsy or the test that, you know, test that I needed. So it was that, that the waiting of not knowing what's coming next. Well, what's, you know, okay, I've got that on the schedule, but I don't have the results of that yet. So when am I going to get this done? It's it's that um, that roller coaster of you know one step to the next, one step to the next. I have to say, with the healthcare insurance that I have, the group that I go to, three hours after I got the call from the radiologist, I was called by the breast nurse navigator, and there were these two women. Their job is to solely help the individual with breast cancer navigate the world of appointments. And they will help you schedule and you can call them anytime and they will give you information. They'll answer your questions. And I, I was just, I was floored. I just, I could not believe that there was this person. Now I had her phone number and she was going to be there to help me. And I used it. I used that resource a lot. Um, and she was, you know, she was incredibly helpful. So yeah, it's a, it is a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster for sure. <laughs> well, I think a lot of it depends on what your diagnosis was, uh, whether it was invasive or not, how large it was, um, and then what your treatment options are. But you have a survival mode that, you know, I've got to get through this. I've, I've got to do that. I, maybe you have a, a wedding coming up or the birth of a grandchild or something like that, that, you know, I, I've got to stay healthy. I've got to get through all this. And there is fear. There is anger. You know, why did this happen to me? Especially if you're a healthy, active, fit vegetarian, you wonder what the heck. And uh, <laughs> then also there's a, a, a grieving process that you go through, I think. Um, how is this going to change me? Uh, how... Are other people going to react to me uh, losing, you know, part of your body? You know, you you grieve for that loss. And some people sit there and wallow in it and other people let themselves feel it and move on <laughs> to the next part because it does all move on. 
there isn't a, an, the other side. So when you talked about nutrition and exercise, are there things that are being recommended now that are really strategic for healing post cancer, radiation therapy, chemo? I can only imagine what all of that does to your body in the moment. So is, are there things that are being recommended now? I did a, uh, wrote a CE course uh, for Endeavor, used to be Penwell, that uh, was talking about the nutrition in a cancer patient. Mm. And the, there's a lot of controversy back and forth on that. Uh, there are a lot of people that think certain herbs uh, and a certain type of diet would prevent, uh, lower your, it definitely lowers your risk. I know my cancer was um, hormone positive. And so one thing that they told me to avoid uh, in the future is soy, because that has a lot of estrogen in it. And so that's, you know, something that I've incorporated in. And you do start to read labels a little bit more. There are a lot of people that are are of the belief that all of the artificials that are in our food these days contribute to the higher incidence of cancer. And then there's others that just say, hey, you know, it, it's kind of like the lung cancer. You know, some people have never smoked, never been exposed to secondary smoke, but yet they have lung cancer. And so there's some that say, hey, if it is meant to be, it's going to happen. And there's not much you can do to prevent it. So there's, there's a, a, you know, both sides of the coin on that. Mary, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I just, for myself personally, I just stayed the course of what I was doing because I really, I've always had just a, you know, a, I'll say, you know, just a really good diet. Um, eating vegetarian, you know, you have to pay attention. So you're, you're getting, you know, everything that you're supposed to get. Um, so I didn't really, I didn't really change anything except I think through radiation, I just really increased my hydration because that was one thing that was recommended. I always drink a lot of water, but I like even upped it, you know, because it, radiation is just basically drying you out. I mean, it's basically cooking you from the inside out. Um, oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> radiation burns are a real thing, you know, uh, so, um, that, and yeah, you do go through a little bit of, uh, Mary's pity party, you know, why me, you know, why me, but you know, we don't get to pick in life. Unfortunately, we don't get to pick in life. And, you know, there was a sense of like, well, why did my body betray me? I've, I've worked so hard to take such good care of it, but I flipped that. And I said, that's, what's going to help me fight it. That's what's going to help me fight it because I'm in such great shape. You know, physically, I was in really good shape. So, you know, that was going to help me get through, you know, the fatigue, which is real. So um, take the nap for anybody out there. Just go take the nap. If you're going through this, I fought it. And then I finally said, why am I fighting this? <laughs> Just go lay down for 45 minutes. It's okay. The body um, needs yeah, to repair. To, to get through sleep. it, right. Yeah. To get through it. Yeah. And I will say that. And I would imagine in that pity party. Oh, sorry, Chris. No, go ahead. I was thinking in that pity party that um, you also get to that point where like, I live a healthy life. Like Jane over there uh, smokes and eats bacon every day and drinks a gallon of wine. I, why, why, why me? Yeah. yeah. Like Mary said, you don't get to pick on that. And there are, are some people depending again on their diagnosis uh, and what the, you know, causes uh, that have been speculated on, they get really hyper-focused on every little thing. And so don't be surprised if a patient in your chair asks you what's in that mouth rinse, what's in that profi paste. They aren't trying to be a PETA patient. They, that's just their normal now. That's their lifestyle. They are that way about everything. They're very careful about what they put in their bodies, whether it is to starve what is currently there or to prevent recurrence. And how does this all shift your priorities in life 
you were talking about the diet, I obviously, and asking those kind of kind of questions, our patients are, their priorities have changed. I think especially while you're going through treatment, you are the priority. And for many of us, you know, as we're caregivers and, and that's a tough, a tough thing to do. Like some, let somebody else take care of you. Um, let somebody else, you know, wait on you and get you things after you've had surgery and all that kind of stuff. But I think for the priority shift is that uh, I've never been like surround myself with drama anyway, but now it's like no drama. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I just don't have time for that right now. <laughs> I want to be about, be around happy people who, you know, are doing good things and, you know, are really positive. I think that's really key. And also to just focus in on your own self-care, whether it's, you know, prayer time or prayer time, meditation, yoga, whatever, whatever it is, your, your walk by yourself in the neighborhood, whatever it is that you have to do, don't look at it as that you're being selfish. You are taking care of yourself. And this is, it's so important when, when you're going through treatment, it's so important. Oh, I agree totally, Mary. Um, the, the self-care is not selfish at all. You've heard it said that don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. It is all small (laughs) stuff. Uh, You want to live more in the moment. You, you know, I personally let a lot of things roll off my back now that I used to get annoyed, uh, aggravated with and stuff. And now it's just, eh. (laughs) You know, let, let, let it go. And I'm a lot happier because of that attitude. I don't, I'm not as stressed because I just, you know, know in the big picture, it's, it's okay. It's okay. The world will keep turning. And so I think that, uh, you know, that shift in the, in the priorities and uh, your diet and things like that, uh, you know, do come into play. Yeah. Mm. And so, I I assume that this journey isn't ever done. And right after you kind of get that moment of like, okay, all is clear that there is some fear of recurrence and PTSD and things like that, that come along with battling this for so many months, Mm -hmm. years, maybe. I have a anxiety, which is every time I go back in for uh, a mammogram and to see my oncologist and the checkup and stuff. I don't really realize it, but I'm holding my breath. And until the, well, the first time the radiologist came in, they said, oh, that radiologist is being to talk to you in a minute. And I, uh, oh my gosh, it's back. You know, the, the radiologist wouldn't be coming in here to talk to me. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. She comes in and talks to everyone. And I went, okay, I was skeptical, but until she came in and she said that everything's fine, we'll see you in six months, then I exhaled what I didn't realize I was holding, you know, and and there's just that anticipation in the anxiety every single time. I don't know if you experienced a similar thing, Mary. Yeah, well, I went, since I was diagnosed in October, I went in April for a diagnostic mammogram on the the cancer side, the left side. And that being is the diagnostic part means that you don't leave until a radiologist has read that x-ray. Because I think they know, like, what that does to our brains and how we go down, you know, you know, the worst street possible to, you know, in our brains. Because that, that's just, I think we're wired that way. Human nature. Yeah. So that was, that was clear. But I go next month for, you know, both sides, bilateral diagnostic mammogram. And I'm already thinking about it, you know. And then it's like, okay, don't think about it. You know, you can't do anything to, you know, you just keep, stay the course, you know. But it's there, you know, it's there. And then you always think, well, what if? And I, you know, just like this week, I saw my my medical oncologist because I'm having some lymphedema problems. So now... I got eight, you know, physical therapy appointments set to help me with that. And it's just this, it's this never ending, like, well, what's, what's coming next? What's coming next? But you just have to focus in on, you know, one thing at a time and take care of it. And just, you know, I, I'm fortunate that I'm at a point in my life, I'm not in my thirties raising kids. You know, I, I have that flexibility, you know, to kind of 
put myself first, which I'm grateful for. Um, but yeah, there is that, that, that kind of in the back of your head talking all the time, like, well, where am I going to be in 10 years? You know, it's, it's a little frightening. And every little twinge, every little ache, pain, you know, it blows through your mind like, oh my gosh, it's back. And sometimes it's uh, fleeting and then other people, you know, can sit there and dwell on it and stuff, but it's still there. It goes through until you talk yourself down out of it. Now, well, let's be realistic, <laughs> you know, and don't. Yeah, like going through radiation. I know the radiation oncologist is like, if you have anything, if it's this, this, you know, they give you like a litany of what to watch for. So then you start and we'll start conjuring it up in your head, you know, like, well, should I, should I, should I tell her that I had a headache one day, you know, or, or did I just have a headache? You know, I mean, it, you could swirl it around a hundred different ways. So, but yeah, I, it's, I know one thing that I did was I had the genetic testing done. Did you, Mary? No, I did not. Okay. I did not. Okay. I think that was, uh, because I did have a family history and I found out during this journey that your paternal family history plays more of a role than your maternal family history, unless it's a direct mother sister type thing. That's interesting. And my cousin was on my father's side and her mother, uh, my father's sister, was also uh, a cancer survivor. So the, I have a daughter. I wanted to see because of that uh, familial history. And uh, also my sister-in-law, my husband's sister uh, had breast cancer as well. So, you know, the odds were against her as far as family history goes, but I wanted to see what uh, genes I had. I wanted to make sure that if she needed more frequent uh, earlier uh, scans and to be watched more closely, because you do have that fear of the genetic aspect of it and passing it on, because you don't want anyone else to have to go through it at all, much less a loved one in the family. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So to wrap this up, I would love to know what good has come from this journey, if there is a silver lining at all, and any advice that you would give others, maybe right now another hygienist is listening, going through this, maybe their family member is, or maybe a loved one or patient which can sometimes be our loved ones, (laughs) could be going through it. I would say, you know, get your mammogram. Um, You know, anybody uh, gets a diagnosis, avoid Dr. Google. That will (laughs) go down that rabbit hole (laughs) because if you'll just drown in it, Um, take the nap, take the nap. And um, the best thing I think for me was, I mean, I already knew my husband was a rock, but, you know, even more so because you need, you need that person that you can lean on. And I think just, I've been always been an outgoing person, but I think being even braver in things that I haven't done before, um, because, you know, it's just, you got to do it. You just got to do it. You just, you know, take that chance and, but take care of yourself, put self care number one, because if you feel good, if you feel rested, it makes everything a whole lot easier. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with that, Chris, but it, it oh, just makes life so much easier if you're well rested. I uh, I think that's I can't disagree with anything that Mary said. I think those are all very uh, big points. I think you're also much more pleasant to be around if you're well rested as well. But I know that uh, the pot. I think the best thing that has come out of all this is that it has strengthened my passion to help others through this journey and also the the positivity it did change priorities it did change my mindset and I let more things just slide off my back that's great advice I would love to as we close out give um, some information about where uh, people could reach you or take your courses how do you feel about people reaching out if they have questions about your journey? I have no problem. Um, 
You can reach me by my email, maryjensenrdh at gmail.com. I'm happy, you know, to share my experience, um, which is individual to everybody else's. So you have to keep that in mind or just, you know, direct you to places where I've gotten more information, you know, solid evidence-based information, which is really important. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to talk to anybody. And I would add one more thing to uh, Mary's advice on that was the Facebook stuff, uh, social media, uh, you know, avoid Dr. Google and a lot of that. I happened on a very, uh, very good support group on there, but there are others that I, you know, checked into that were very negative, very angry people and full of a lot of misinformation. And so uh, there are support groups out there. Take advantage of that. For my information, I enjoy sharing, you know, my experience. I have broad shoulders. I have a good ear. I like to listen. And my uh, email is Chris, K-R-I-S, at chrispottsrdh.com. And I have a website, the chrispottsrdh.com, and that is kind of devoted to my speaking topics and advice on this cancer journey. And I'm getting ready to launch a couple of new uh, projects out of that as well in order to reach other survivors and as well as uh, dental professionals, medical professionals that I feel have a need for more education on how to deal with the patients that are going through this journey. That's amazing. Well, I really do appreciate you guys taking the time and telling us your experiences and your journey. Um, I'm so thankful that you are here to tell us that as well. (laughs) And I'm sure there's going to be somebody that reaches out to you that um, has a few questions. So thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much too. Yeah. Th- thank you, Michelle, for all the that you do, uh, you and Andrew on the, the podcast, the informations that you bring and for inviting us to, you know, share oh, course, our side of, course. of things, our story. Oh, I'm back thank at you. Ya. You guys are both amazing. <laughs> thank you. Well, I hope everyone, um, felt a little uplifted and you learned it a little bit about what not to say. And then some of the um, issues and the mental uh, health side of going through things like a a nice little cancer scare or actual treatment. So we have a lot of travel coming up soon. Michelle's going to be at AOSH coming up in end of October. October 17th. It's a American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. And um, it's called, the whole course is called Coll- Collaboration Cures. So it's, um, I, I think it's like five different associations coming together. I might be incorrect with that particular number, but there's a lot of so- associations. There's a website that they, they could check out. Yeah, you should probably do that. Either aosh.org or um, just do Collaboration Cures Nashville. And I'm sure that will pop up, but a really good course. And then we have Tony Stephanie's course. I'm going to be taking that one beyond the operatory Yes. in New York City at the end of, it's the 24th, 25th, 25th, or 25th 26th of October. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's any spots left. It usually fills up pretty quick. So check that out. I'll be there if you guys wanted to join that real quick. And then we have nothing until Greater New York, or do you have some travel? I was going to say, that's adorable. Uh, no, I am traveling quite a bit. Um, I am going to Do Life Retreat November 14th. And that is um, with Do Magazine, which is General Entrepreneur Women's Magazine um, with Anne uh, Duffy, who is amazing, the sweetest, kindest person. And she's having a big retreat. I think there's like 80 or 100. I get to room with uh, Edie Ivy and Sandy Lee. So that'd be a fun one. That should be interesting. Some recording going on in that room. That should definitely be interesting. And then, yeah, Greater New York. Greater New York. And yeah. Yeah. Hope everybody's, I hope you're, if you're there, please come hang out with us. If you haven't already checked out the Dental Podcast Network, please go ahead and do that. We have two channels over there. Lots of our favorite um, guests that have been on the Tell 2 Hygienist now have their own individual shows. Lots of topics to choose from, daily content, really short format. So you guys can listen to it on your drive into work, on your drive home. 
anytime you just need to be inspired, it's really a nice little pep talk. Um, we've had some really, really good um, feedback already from all of the shows, and it's been really good. Yep. And um, definitely check out uh, PDT. We could not give CE for this particular podcast, but they are always supporting us. CE Zoom. We definitely appreciate those two companies and support them. So don't forget to like the new Facebook page, Dental Podcast Network. Also follow A Tale to Hygienist. And if you haven't already found us both on Instagram, the Dental Podcast Network and A Tale to Hygienist. And you can head over to A Tale to Hygienist.com. And we have a new website, BT Dubs. We have a new website and you can actually search for people on our website. So if you have a particular episode or if it was a particular person that you wanted to talk or listen to, or if you wanted to find CE, we have them kind of separated as tip episodes and ones that we've done with mission work. So there's all kinds of stuff there. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter where you're gonna get monthly content from us, um, where it's nice little recaps and um, we have some product specials on there so you can get some uh, discounts or free samples or something. So head over to a tale to hygienist.com and sign up and or I guess sub subscribe to that newsletter. That is all for me. And that is all for me. I hope everyone has a great week. Great. Bye, y'all.